know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. In 1947, there were more than 300 princely states in India. With the advent of Indian independence, you know, a lot of the families uh, lost their power and lost their wealth. But there is one family which still plays a very important role in Indian history, and that is the Sindhyas of Gwalior. Today, we are joined by senior political journalist, Mr. Rashid Kidwai, on his new book, The House of Sindhya. Mr. Kidwai, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Thank you, Akshay, and thank you, Live History, for inviting me. So, Mr. Kidwai, I want to ask you, uh, you know, the first question is that what is it about the house of the Sindhyas, about the Sindhya family that, uh, you know, makes them so alluring in Indian politics? The fact that even 75 years after independence, they are extremely powerful and dominating the politics of North India. So, actually, as you said in your you know, opening remarks that there were many princely states were there uh, at the time of independence and integration took place. And many of those Nawabs and uh, kings and queens, they lost their uh, power. Power in the sense that uh, whether political or economic power or they kind of connect with the people or with their subjects they had. But I think Sindhya's have been a lone exception. If we look around, uh, perhaps in the entire history of the world, which that study I have not conducted, but uh, it's worth exploring. That since nine, uh, 1731, here is a family which has been in business, uh, in, in governance, in one form or other. Uh, much more than, uh, you know, in Indian politics, uh, uh, it was amusing for me to note that, you know, no, normally Gandhi family is considered as, you know, first among equals. But if you go by just number of days and hours uh, and post-independent in India, it is Sindhyas who have been, you know, more uh, in power. Uh, I have documented in my book that since 1957, the second general election, uh, till date as we speak, there's been more than one person, one Sindhya uh, family member, one or more, in either in Lok Sabha or in Rajya Sabha or in the State Assembly. Whereas in the Nehru Gandhi family, there was a gap that between uh, after Rajiv Gandhi's assassination in uh, 91 till uh, 98, uh, in fact, 99, uh, till 99 actually, when Sonia Gandhi got elected to parliament, there was this gap of eight, nine years when the no member of Nehru Gandhi family, even Menika was not in parliament because she had lost 91 election other branch of uh, Nehru Gandhi family. So that way, uh, Sindhyas have been very, I would not say uh, just uh, fortunate, but they've been very uh, visionary and thoughtful about it, that their evolution and the connect with the masses, they have maintained uh, rather successfully. So you know, you have observed Madhya Pradesh politics. So this Gwalior Chambal region, is there something uh, in that region or that, or that social system, just to understand the Sindhya families uh, hold and power that the, the what they call the polit politics of the mehel uh, is there a reason why you know unlike say even in Indore or in Bundelkhand uh, you know we don't see the mehel politics so strong uh, so is there a reason yeah there there are reasons Sakshay, and there is more than one reason first of all it's very you know carefully uh, cultivated uh, in the sense that by the Sindhyas. And from the beginning, uh, when uh, this kind of, they started fighting elections, and when they started fighting election on separate symbols and political parties, yet that, you know, the Sindhya family from Mahal, as you described, from Mahal, they will be an informal directive to vote for uh, all those who belong to Mahal, whether they are a BGP candidate or they are a Congress candidate. And... Uh, they used to always have this kind of thing in their address pronouncements, whether it was Rajmata Sindhya or Madhav Sindhya or Jyotiritya Sindhya or Yashodra Raja Sindhya. They would always say Gwalior ki Praja. They would be addressing them as their subjects. And they would always, so it worked. If you call, uh, you know, Madhav Rao, Madhav Rao in Gwalior, he would not like. If you address Madhav Sindhya in Delhi as Madhav Ji, uh, he would be okay with it. 
so he used to say it and i think uh, uh, late mother of sindhya was very i would say candid about it because he said he has to have this kind of maharaja image because that's what people you know wanted or to see it if there is a chair then there should be just one chair so all those you know democracy would take back seat in uh, gwalior chambal region uh, you know that has worked to uh, sindhya's advantage i think it's also lack of uh, agrarian reforms uh, you know very poor uh, socio economic indicators uh, uh, all these uh, factors have contributed and i think political parties are responsible largely because like i have documented in my book that jawaharlal nehru when he saw this rise of uh, hindu mahasabha uh, in first election 1951 52 election uh, hindu mahasabha won from gwalior so he just looked for it because he didn't want uh, the hindu right to rise anywhere in the country what he did was uh, uh, i have given in a great details he actually summoned uh, uh, maharaja of gwalior who was reluctant to face nehru because nehru was a towering personality to his and his wife and nehru very plainly he said you fight for us so for two years i mean two elections 57 lok sabha and 62 election uh, rajmata fought as congress candidate and won and she was quite right wing but politics was such so i think political class also has perpetuated that uh, myth of uh, this kind of uh, you know maharaja maharaja maharani rule in that region that you were asking so you know there's something very interesting which you touched on you know i had also done an uh, article sometime back on how this gwalior chambal region was the uh, the core or the womb of the hindu uh, nationalist movement and the fact is that the sindhya darbar and sardar Ang- like senior sardar angre and others had supported hindu mahasabha from 1930s so so you know the considering the fact and the fact that uh, you know i mean as you reveal in your book the rajmata practically financed the sang parivar uh, in its uh, early days so how how do you see the relationship between rajmata sindhya and the sang parivar yeah i think you are so very kind of uh, pertinent and uh, there is that i was very actually intrigued uh, akshay while doing this research because the sindhyas were not only they were very just rulers they were also very uh, secular secular in the sense of having equal respect i think more than equal respect they had for uh, 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 for muslim community for instance because it had to do with a bit of a history that uh, when the uh, mahaji maharaj when, when the third battle of panipat panipat he was very grievously injured and he was uh, saved by and rescued by one uh, rane khan who took him uh, from there to from panipat to deccan uh, on a bullock cart and that's how his uh, life was saved and there was a uh, there is still a shrine in gwalior called uh, that uh, mansur shah shrine so there are these people are very much uh, kind of uh, uh, i would say uh, grateful there is a sense of gr- gratitude that sindhya family members have uh, towards mansur mansur shah that they think that he had blessed them and that's how their kind of rule survived for 300 years etc and uh, in one instance when this madhav maharaj the earlier maharaja when he was getting married uh, second time because he didn't have a male child so you know he akshay he did not formalize his marriage in gwalior city that mahal he went some 50 60 kilometers away simply because the muslim community which was less than 6% of gwalior was observing month of muharram so just can you imagine in a sort of a, Uh, monarchy this kind of consideration is quite unthinkable i think uh, rajmata sindhya if i can say so she was singularly responsible for this right tilt but jivaji rao you know maharaj was not so much uh, uh, you know kind of uh, uh, tilted towards uh, uh, hindu right wing in fact i would say that he was not so politically inclined though he became rajya pramok and he was able to uh you know uh, negotiate the very difficult time of partition of india and after that i think rajmata from the beginning was very much uh, uh, anti mahatma gandhi uh, politically anti congress anti nehru and she had certain notions and as you rightly pointed out sardar angre stroked that feeling and uh, interestingly much of uh, i can say with the degree of uh, i would say satisfaction that much of the problem that we saw later on between her son madhav or sindhya and uh, rajmata 
also had to do the west because mother roy had studied in england and he was very liberal in his outlooks and he didn't like though he became jansang uh, uh, mp in 1971 but he was uncomfortable and the last point that i mean from my side in the sense that what you were mentioning about the she funding you know hugely uh, just sang parivar activists whether it was jansang or other hindu mahasabha etc actually that had created lot of you know wedge between mother and son because son realized that uh, you know a lot of money is going just not for her politics but for the survival of entire uh, i might coin the term ecosystem of that that time now they talk over different ecosystem of congress ecosystem but that ecosystem so rajmata was funding and this is something that mother or apparently resented and that led to a lot of bitterness so you know rajmata and especially the her relationship with the bjp now what is interesting is uh I mean, she was the Maharani of Gwalior, and in 1950s and all, it was a very big thing, and with the money and power and influence which they have. But even even now, when you see, you know, uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee is mentioned, Deen Dayal Upadhyay is mentioned. Now, Atal Bihari Vajpayee is a is a hero. Uh, but somewhere down the line, don't you think this there there is a discomfort in the BJP about their Rajmata's legacy and the critical role i mean uh, how do you see that i mean it's it's a very interesting uh, uh, i mean on one hand they want to pay tribute to her but they're also uncomfortable especially the current regime so so how do you see that akshay first of all i want to compliment you for you know asking very pertinent question very pointed one and that actually baffled me because uh, this is something he was a person i can imagine uh, pandit jawalal nehru not making her a uh, you know minister and all because that time they were very towering leaders for the from freedom struggle uh, so all those problems were there but then she was a architect of first non congress government in madhya pradesh uh, when there was you know she had caused a kind of uh, defection uh, govind narayan singh ministry and subsequently several uh, bjp ministries in madhya pradesh and bjp became came to power in 1996 for 13 days and then in 1998 and she lived till 2001 so she was never made minister uh, in you know even just for a token in uh, in that government or for the better in 1977 ministry which had a uh, lot of jansang uh, ministers in uh, morarji desai uh, government i think one was this rajmata's own uh, indifferent uh, you know attitude towards uh, you know offices at all she was in a way she was a very simple person in the sense that she would make lot of sacrifices and allowed herself to be politically exploited by i would say some kind of mail order remember you know finding a you know feet for a woman uh, is not easy if she had asserted herself like her daughter did in uh, and she's still doing vasundhara rajya sindhya in rajasthan politics because we know rajasthan dynamics it was very difficult for a woman uh, you know chief minister to occupy that chair so i think rajmata didn't do this then there was an episode because she made lot of sacrifices and uh, this is something both family and rss and everyone is quite or jansang is silent about it i think what happened after uh, the emergency because in during the emergency she was jailed and mind you it was very difficult uh, i have given lot of description how she was kept in tihar and it was very dirty and uh, or even for a common uh, citizen of the country not to talk of a you know maharani so i think she took you know pay, uh, she was released on parole and all and she took some kind of medical this thing there was some contact was there between indira gandhi's aide rk dawan and her own daughter usha rajay sidhya who uh, lives in nepal so certain concession was there uh, amita bachan's father in law that tarun kumar bhaduri who was a journalist statesman correspondent in uh, bhopal he has written a book i did that he has uh, sort of interviewed rajmata where he says that there was some kind of tacit understanding was there that rajmata would not return to active politics you know indira gandhi of 1975 76 was a ruthless person so if she was given some concession this was an exchange of a kind of tacit understanding that she would not you know become active player in politics but yet in 1980 when uh, bjp was formed officially she became uh, vice president she was a founding member and i think somewhere because they came from gwalior region atalbari bajpai and rajmata i think rajmata got overshadowed subsequently 
by atal bihari vajpayee oh that is interesting so you know uh, before i come to madhura and the emergency with this something very interesting because i have uh, you know i mean i have found uh, bharaj jivaji rao very interesting and i was looking at a lot of the correspondence in the national archives uh, uh, regarding the merger and gwalior state and madhya bharat and all and one of the most controversial but never spoken about chapters of gwalior history is mahatma gandhi's assassination because uh, the pistol which was used uh, to uh, assassinate the beretta originally belonged to uh, philos uh, i think it was antony philos who was maharaja's secretary and it has never been determined how it got in hands of nathuram uh, godse and all so how how do you see and then there was a lot of controversy i mean subsequent to that as well so how do you see the sindhyas the hindu mahasabha and uh, mahatma gandhi and this whole controversy i think from academic sources and all there is obviously a little of suspicion that points towards gwalior when i say gwalior it did not necessarily mean uh, the royal family of gwalior it could be some residents of gwalior some elements in gwalior but there was something is there and i have quoted uh, uh, you know tushar gandhi and all who have written uh, uh, very extensively about this to that how uh, you know a pistol that you mentioned the italian pistol the pistol itself to uh, akshay has a lot of history i don't know how many people were uh, you know killed and assassinated by that particular uh, italian make uh, pistol because it came from you know gray market and finally someone found out and i think uh, at that time also all these things were talked about but it was never nailed i am i'm prepared to give some kind of benefit of doubt to uh, to the royal family that they may not have known what was happening and uh, some elements maybe not even officially members of hindu mahasabha because you know this uh, uh, every uh, political party has you know different flavors in it so when we say about rss or hindu mahasabha or bharti jansang you know there are savarkarites there are you know non savarkarite there are people who are followers of dindyal upadhyay so the element of you know extremism or, or degree you know differs from one another so you just can't uh, paint them with a, a similar brush so this is a thing but this is a area that i think uh, more Uh, academic research is uh, required i think at that time uh, some real investigation should have taken place there was kapoor commission and others were there but they all left it half open i mean it's like a glass half empty or half full so the sindhyas were someone can argue they were they were malign for this but i think that's uh, one chapter that unfortunately will remain uh, you know mysterious and uh, there will always be fingers pointing at them so oh, interesting it is now mother of sindhya i mean the whole another uh, chapter and this conflict in the sindhya family emerges when uh, in the early 80s he moves to the congress now there are two views of this one say that uh, you know he was liberal and there was sardar angre and rajpatra he didn't agree with his father uh, the second version says that i mean their properties were destroyed and he wanted to save his wealth and save his properties so you know being a political journalist how do you see madhavra of sindhya i mean do you think he, he it was just the money or he wanted to carve something out of because he was in the janasang before he went into the uh, uh, congress so how how do you see his personality see yeah, akshay i had the benefit of uh, uh, interacting with madhavra of sindhya uh, numerous countless uh, amount of time not so much like focusing on because that time i was not writing book but i understood him i can say this i think at heart uh, you know he was a liberal he would not have approved of the kind of uh, politics that bjp is uh, playing today uh, and uh, of course uh, there was money problem was there and i think more importantly uh, mother of sindhya was i could say uh, initial years of his youth years was there was some kind of absence of ideology was there like it happens with uh, many youngsters uh, who are very comfortable in life and uh, when he studied in uh, uh, oxford also he was not known for you know his that kind of uh, 
political activism remember of 1960s and all was uh, was a great uh, kind of upheaval in europe and all those things were happening uh, i have not come across uh, that can apply to rajiv gandhi also and sonia that they were not part of uh, any that kind of uh, movement uh, actively or uh, otherwise so uh, i think when he returned to india he was very deeply hurt and agitated by this uh, abolition of uh, private purses when this uh, because that was a kind of uh, uh, offer that was made to all the princely states who had uh, uh, integrated with uh, union of india and union of india sort of went back uh, they had a kind of after thought so as a result uh, he wanted to kind of teach indira gandhi a lesson not only him even uh, uh, mansoor ali khan tiger patodi also had contested assembly election for patodi he lost but sindhya ji contested as independent uh, uh, person in 1971 from uh, gwalior he was supported by bharti janson and he won but he, when he won he did not join uh, uh, you know bharti janson and then that emergency came and he fled and then sardar angre who had a great influence on rajmata i have written that she was literally actually 25 steps away from nepal so what had happened sequence of event uh, says that mother was in calcutta and with the help of his friends he went to nepal and subsequently went to england when while he was in nepal he organized through intermediary that Uh, Rajmata should come, and two of his sisters, that uh, Vasudhara Rajay and Yashodhara Rajay, should come. Usha Rajay was already there, so there will be family will be, you know, united. And uh, Rajmata, in her memoirs, has acknowledged this concern of uh, what you know she describes him as Bhaiya. So she thinks that Bhaiya was right, but Sardar Angre, who had a lot of influence, and he thought he told her that you know by going to Nepal. You will be betraying all those who are fighting against Indira Gandhi for democracy, freedom of expression, etc. And then she did not cross over, and that created a huge uh, kind of you know uh, bitterness and a very sharp divide. So I think coming to your original uh, question, I think Madhava was uncomfortable, and between that period when uh, Sardar Angre influenced Rajmata tilted towards uh, Bharti Jan Sang uh, more so. Anti Indra, uh, there were elements in the Congress who worked on uh, Madhav Sindhya and Indra Gandhi also, and she said, "Come back, and you know we'll we'll promote you." And that's what happened. Madhav came and joined Congress and won 1980 election as a Congress member of Parliament. This, but I think temperamentally, I would insist temperamentally he was more comfortable in the Congress tent rather than Jansang. you know that time jansen was also considered as a you know in the social if you have a informal social pecking order it was quite considered low mm-hmm. and congress was the elite at that point of time so you know i would uh, now come to the sisters you know vasundhara rajay and yashodhara rajay it is very interesting that even though rajmata had such a rich legacy i mean for example even the ram janmabhoomi and the babri masjid andolan i mean she was with murli manohar joshi and uh, Uh, Lal Krishna Advani. She was the third Trimurti. I mean, third uh, ideologue uh, of this that whole movement, Vishwa Hindu Parishad, and all. But it is strange that both the daughters had to carve out political career for themselves. I mean, they did not directly inherit uh, that legacy from the mother, and I mean, they had to do a lot of things from scratch. So, how do you see the daughters carrying forward Rajmata's legacy? I think. one has to give it to a credit of this uh, of that generation politicians of rajmata one could agree or disagree with their uh, political view but they were not you know overtly you know uh, favorable to dynast and dynasty culture but if they were opposed to uh, rise and rise of indira gandhi so they could not think of promoting their own uh, children you look at lal krishna advani i was just reading in 2005 there was a move to make her daughter Rajya Sabha member and Advani, you know, scuttled that move. So these are the things we can just say it in line. But I know, and you also know now, seeing the country's politics, it's very difficult not to do such things. So I think there was uh, Rajmata was not very keen, and Rajmata had a kind of, uh, I would say, 
burden that she thought that uh, she had got Vasundhara Rajay married uh, very early in life and uh, much against uh, the you know kind of opinion that was given to her at that point of time about the ruler ruling family of Dalpur with whom Sindhyas had fought uh, military war etc. Also, so she was married and it didn't work. Uh, we do not know what were the reasons and then kind of came back and and came back with a you know uh, very young uh, infant uh, son. So I think Rajmata had a lot of sympathy and she wanted to do something. And at that time, uh, Atal Bari Bajpayee was a very close associate. They sensed it. And they kind of, uh, you know, drafted uh, Vasundhara Raja Siddhya in uh, politics. So in some ways, she had, she got some help as being Rajmata's uh, daughter. And of course, uh, to the credit of Vasundhara Raja Siddhya, she became an iconic figure in uh, uh, BJP, Rajasthan politics, even today. I would go to the extent of saying that if there is anyone who has inherited uh, Rajmata's uh, political acumen and legacy, it is Vasundhara Raja Sindhya. It was not Mother of Sindhya. I would not say it is Jyotiritya Sindhya or Yashodra. That kind of, you know, that fire in the belly, that kind of concern for the people, that comfort, that ease that, uh, you know, Vasundhara has when she goes uh, uh, for campaigning or with the people, with the masses. You know, the connect is very instant. There is no Maharaja. I mean, I can say I have traveled with uh, almost all of them, actually, in their political campaigns and all. And this is my subjective uh, analysis. I think Raj, uh, Vasundra is most uh, at ease uh, when, you know, dealing with this uh, sort of heart and uh, this kind of things of, of, of uh, conditions or... Uh, people's uh, uh, admiration and all kind of weird requests and delivery mechanism. She is, has a very hands-on approach. M many of these schemes that today Narendra Modi is following and uh, taking credit, actually some of them were, you can say, pilot project, but initiated by Vasundhara Rajya Sindhya and she's not getting that credit. There is a visible tension between uh, BGP leadership and Vasundhara Rajya. So this is all there. So in that fighter spread, I think she has inherited from uh, 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 Rajbata Sindhya. Yashodra, had a, Yashodra was also a rebel in a different sense that she was the first Sindhya to have got married outside, uh, uh, you know, that so to say, the uh, royals and family. She married a commoner, went to America. And, you know, she would stand in queue, go to, uh, you know, mall, look for, you know, those kind of... Uh, items that were there for sale and all kind of things that you know a normal person does and and she did it for years uh, then uh, she returned to india and by that time i mean uh, rajmata was not so politically relevant and that bitterness between mother and son was very grave so she had to really struggle and find her feet even now she is not no one mentions her as a chief ministerial candidate and I think I, uh, Jyoti Radhika Sindhya's return to the BJP would, uh, you know, damage her politically. They may not want to be, but uh, Jyoti Radhika Sindhya, as we know, is first among equals in uh, Madhya Pradesh BJP as things stand today. So, uh, Yashodra, you know, without, you know, her uh, doing or undoing, she has, you know, fallen a step back. So, you know, you have interacted with Madhur of Sindhya and with Jyotir Aditya. So how do you find uh, the uh, difference between the two? I think, you see, this is a very interesting question, I would say, that uh, I've also analyzed and written a lot about, you know, uh, Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi. They are mother and son, again, very close, uh, best of friends, I would say, very uh, close. But temperamentally, they're very different. Their worldview is very different. Sonia has this Japanese method of maximum consultation. Rahul wants to judge Congress people. He's trying to, unfortunately, trying to judge Congress from position of weakness. If he was winning election, if Congress winning election, he would have been judging from position of strength. So there would have been no crisis. So similarly, I think uh, Mother Rao and Jyotiraditya, they're very, very different. Mother Rao had, uh, was a very, actually, deep person. He understood, you know, the psyche 
of uh, uh, of people and it's because he had a you know leg in the past and in the present he was a very modern man a very aristocratic man man who could divide his time quite judiciously between work and play he liked good things in life i think he lived life fullest it was very unfortunate the manner in which uh, uh, you know he was killed in a uh, air crash and uh, jyotiradya sindhya is is in a bit of a hurry you know he wants to this is what i have document i written in the book that he wants to actually fulfill the unfinished agenda of sindhyas i don't want to dwell upon it but there is a unfinished uh, agenda of sindhyas which you have raised twice in the sense of what happened to rajmata vis-a-vis -vis getting a place in the bjp and madhav sindhya in the congress he was uh, you know among i would say top 2 3 4 leaders had he lived perhaps he would have edged out mother uh, manmohan singh in 2004 or certainly in 2009 or now you know he had a leadership and he was sonia gandhi's very good friend uh, i mean allow me to say this i think perhaps they were on a first name basis they would address each other sonia and madhav so all these things are so jyotiraditya again had to fight and when at some point he realized look what am i doing i mean my grandmother didn't get her dues uh, my father did not get dues let me try it because he has everything he is bilingual he is smart he has a huge following he has a lot of ideas he understands finance economy how money comes and goes and has a i would say despite that defeat from guna has a connect with the masses so i think somewhere in the uh, you know deep down his heart he is nursing that ambition legitimately why not maybe Five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty. After twenty years, also he would be this, you know, seventy. Mm -hmm. Why not? There is yeah. a office of prime minister that everyone aspires for. True, interesting. So now coming to my last question, the story of the Sindhyas in the post-independence period has been, you know, these two camps uh, about, you know, people have spoken about their hedging, where, uh, you know, because they had influence in Congress and BJP. you know they were protected from all the sides and all and last year the dynamics have changed now for the first time all the sindhya eggs are in a in the bjp's basket a party where there is also a lot of discomfort with the sindhya legacy and their contribution to the uh, the hindu hindutva movement and all of that so it's 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 a very interesting phase of the sindhya family so how how do you see the situation now since last year i think it has come to a very uh, crucial and decisive phase normally the logic and rationale of uh, that uh, dynastic politics is that you know you you have a trust in and faith in in your family member there are certain elements uh, whether it's a question of you know selfless advice money management resource management all those things there are a lot of you know gray areas so where a family member uh, can be trusted this is what mamta banerji is doing this is what you know congress has done this is what i mean i have documented that about uh, in 25 to 30% uh, dynast are actually second generation third generation they cut across all political parties i sorry i'm saying 25% 30% of elected representatives in our country are second generation third generation dynast so it's not just about you know congress problem or so there is a deep trust but most of them have been on the one side of uh, political ideology that sindhya family had this uh, in case of madhav rao and rajmata there were a lot of bitterness but yet that they had this common interest ki mahal ko nuksan nahi pahunchayenge they did not fight against each other they did not campaign against each other in many instances when uh, even rajmata was far more flamboyant and emotional she would do this but when this even this when election happened between uh, uh, atal bari bajpai and uh, uh, mother of sindhya of 1984 in which atal bari bajpai lost uh, it is said that a uh, lot of people who were supporters of uh, rajmata sindhya actually voted for uh, mother rao so this has been the legacy now there is a different thing now there is a situation there are two aunts and one nephew a uh, nephew is a rising star is a uh, you know shining star among lesser moons i would say so it depends to be seen how far this lesser moons would act upon because uh, this is not 
that kind of culture of uh, acceptability, even when they were seemingly in public forum, they were separate, you know, they kept that Mahal interest intact. But today, that's not a feeling that, uh, 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 and why do Vasundra has no experience? She has proved herself again and again. Uh, I would say, some would say that much more than even Jyotiraditya Sandhya. So how the two, you know, would uh, carve their place within the BJP. Uh, that is something uh, very interesting. And of course, there is, of course, Yashodra question. I think she's a little understated. She does not have that kind of fighting spirit, but she also needs a space there. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives. I mean, I'm sure uh, all our viewers would love to, you know, know many more interesting stories uh, of the Sindhya family, the role in politics, the, the palace intrigues and all. And you, know, you will find all of this in uh, Mr. Rashid Kidwai's book, The House of Sindhya. So thank you. Thank you so much for speaking to us.